Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen, and I hope you all can see me because <laughs> I can't see myself. Um, welcome, 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 welcome. We are here to participate in this mental health conference. My name is Karen Brown. I'm health ministries leader here at Bladensburg Seventh-day Adventist Church in Lanham, Maryland, where uh, J. Melvin Janie is pastor, and we are hosting the state of our mental health, leveraging experiences to renew, restore, and reset. So we are here starting with week one, program number two, actually program number three. If you caught the gem that we had today at 12 noon, we actually had a gem at 12 noon where Armina and where Nisha actually um, presented at 12 noon. So we are actually at item number three on week one. And this conference is going from May 1st through May 7th from uh, 7.30 on Friday evenings and four o'clock on Saturday afternoons. And with a gem that usually happens on sa Saturday afternoon at 12 noon, all are invited to attend. So let's get started with prayer. Um, uh, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for bringing this opportunity for us to talk about healing our hearts and our spiritual and mental selves. Thank you, Father, for providing these wonderful experts to help us along the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, again, I'm so excited about this, this weekend, about um, the next five weeks. This is week one of weeks of a, a six-week series. This conference was started because Pastor Jamie had a burden on his heart. Um, he could see that there was pain in the congregation and, and throughout the community. And he said, what can we do about this? So Health Ministries team put together a six week program and I have a wonderful team of about six, eight people. And um, we put together a program and, and here it is to address the sadness, the helplessness, the pain, the anguish over the last two years, the coping and the lack thereof. Uh, we sought out experts with wisdom and knowledge to help provide ways to educate and encourage everyone. Please get your notepad, your iPad, your piece of paper, your pen, your uh, whatever you need to do to write everything down, write your questions in the chat and, um, and we'll do our very best to answer questions as we go along. Um, if you have questions that are specific to the, the facilitator and they're sensitive in nature, please feel free to let us know that you have a sensitive question and then we will direct you to um, the, the facilitator who's Armina and Wernisha um, today, okay? So uh, we're gonna go right into um, our health nugget. Um, this is called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. This is something we'll be doing each and every week in providing you a link of how life actually connects with your, with your health and your mental health. So here we go. Hi, my name is Karen Brown and I'm going to provide for you our wonderfully and fearfully made segment for this conference. Listen in, interesting information. To share with you my screen and provide for you some information about pain. Did you happen to know that medical providers are beginning to understand the importance of religious matters when it comes to physical and mental health conditions? True. So what is faith? Let's just talk about that for just a second. So in the religious context, Faith is a belief in God or a doctrine or teachings. It gives people something to believe in. It provides a sense of structure. It is a positive, has a positive impact on our mental health. Did you happen to know that research in recent years has found that religious faith and faith-based communities have a better outlook on their illness and mental stressors, and therefore 
it snowballs into risk factors that are reduced. Less heart disease, less diabetes, and less stroke. So what is the impact when you have a better outlook on faith through your mental health eyes? You have, a better cope, you have better coping methods. You're more hopeful and less negative. You have a sense of purpose. Your forgiveness is at an all time high. There is peace of mind better quality of life, and the numbers, the data, if you will, is showing that there are people who have less depression and lower levels of anxiety and suicide. Understanding your spiritual history is something that can be helpful when you go to your physician. You can ask your doctor to take a look at the whole picture of you by asking about your religious and spiritual history. It's a few questions um, that they can um, provide and so they can get a good picture of who you are from every standpoint, mental, physical, and spiritual. Take the opportunity to talk to your doctor, your nurse practitioner, your physician assistant, and anybody who will listen, actually. But it, it is a great opportunity for you to really speak to your, um, your provider and get information and give them information about the whole picture of you. Get your mental health history, find out how your faith impacts your health, and we will see you again. Hello, can everyone see me now? Just say yes, anyone can just jump in and say yes. I'm having a little technical issues because I, I understand no one can see my, my presentation. Is that we hear correct? you, I hear you. Okay, okay, can everyone see my face? We can see you. Wonderful, yes. wonderful, okay, wonderful. Um, I want to introduce to you, and I'm sorry about the, the presentation, you didn't actually see the video, the presentation, but you could hear it. So hopefully good information you could actually hear. So um, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Her name is Armina Domingue. Armina is a native New Yorker who loves, loves, loves to help people and draw strengths from purposeful, um, living a purpose, having, having people live their purposeful and joyful life. Her mantra over the years has been to, um, has been only when there is understanding, true healing will begin. Over the past 15 years, she's been a clinician, a program manager, um, a program manager, a clinical director, supervisor, coach for many clinicians in the counseling field. She received her master's of social work from Adelphi University in Garden City, New York in 2002. Um, she is, um, she uh, in, includes in her, um, her clientele, children, adolescents, families, and adults. She has an extensive training in treating childhood trauma PTS, I'm sorry, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, which includes cognitive behavioral therapy and, and trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy, both evidence-based treatments modalities. So Armina supports um, trauma recovery for better emotional, physical, and relationship health. She um, has also worked in community health settings, social, social schools settings, a school, social work settings, child family agencies, mental health agents, uh, advocacy organizations, managed care and private practice, of which she has a private practice now. 
Um, she utilizes a variety of techniques and skills drawn from um, um, recognized therapy modalities, including the cognitive behavioral therapy, as I mentioned before, solution focus, DBT, psychoeducation, play therapy, behavior modification, mindfulness, and relaxation. Armina believes in creating a working relationship, working uh, partnership with clients utilizing their strengths to help them sort out their challenges and their goals and to achieve their goals. She also recognizes and realizes the importance of um, to identify all aspects of the individual's life that impact their well-being, including their physical health, supportive systems like family and friends, work and or school environments, faith, spirituality in it, this process. We welcome Armina, and we also are gonna welcome Warnisha Foxworth, who um, Arne Armina is going to introduce to us as well. Welcome, welcome, and thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Karen, for that introduction. Again, we are so excited to be here. Um, I brought with me my partner today, Wanisha, and I'm going to read Wanisha's bio because I want you all to kind of really know who I brought along with me. So Wanisha is a Philadelphia native. Um, she has an extensive experience in leadership roles with national service and educational organizations. She is a graduate of Morgan State University, woohoo, and she has served two years with City Year Greater Philadelphia, both as a founding court member and a senior court member in the communications department. She also was the executive director for City Year as well. Um, Juanisha was one of the first City Year staff members on the grounds after Hurricane uh, Katrina, answering calls and serving in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Juanisha committed, Juanisha's committed to the success of her city um, and it didn't stop with City Year. After that, she became the Chief Operating Officer for the Communities and Schools of Philadelphia. Um, she has been the founding executive director of College Possible in Philadelphia and recently works with the City of Philadelphia, the School District of City of Philadelphia, where she works on the intervention team. And so I'm just super excited to have her with me today. She is hanging out in Candor Consultant Firm as the training and um, program director. And so she helps us with all of our trainings. She helps us work with some of our contracts where we provide executive coaching to them. And so I'm just super excited, Juanisha, that you trust me enough to come and ride along with me today. So we have been, as Karen has said, this is our third go round with you all. And we want to do a temperature check. And usually in the field of mental health, there's a question that we typically ask. And the question is, um, how are you doing, right? And so Karen, I'm gonna ask if you could give me host privileges so I could be able to share my screen. And last night we tried the, how are you doing thing? And so what we did was we put up this little picture of some cute dogs, different faces, different facial expressions from one to nine. And I want you guys to take a look at the picture and in the chat box, I want you to tell us, how are you doing? And using the dog scale, so from one to nine, you may have multiple numbers, right? Because you may have different emotions and feelings going on right now. Put it in the chat. We want to see, we want to hear, how are you doing? And so while they're doing that, Wanisha, I'm just to check in with you first. So how are you doing today? Um, I'm good. I feel like I am dog um, number three a little bit. It's like, I'm here, Yeah, I'm excited to be here, but I'm a little weary, you know? I don't think, I can't remember the last time we've done three sessions sort of back to back to back um, mm -hmm. with different topics. I'm excited about it, but it's like, yeah. all right, we're, we're gonna get through. Um, it looks like he's just like leaning a little to the side on the chair, but like present. How about you? How are you doing today? Um, so last night I was number two, but today I am number six 
And I'm number six and maybe seven. I'm chill, you know, we're on the home stretch for this week. And so I'm feeling a little relieved, not so much anxiety, not so much nervousness, but I'm excited to talk with folks today. Great. So I see that there's some numbers in the chat. What are you seeing on your end, Wanisha? I see we have a number one and a number six, you know, totally different on the spectrum, which is very interesting, yeah. like in my blanket and then I'm totally happy. So I'd, I'd love to hear from everybody else to which dog represents where you are at this moment. This doesn't mean this is your dog face all the time, right? My dog face changes probably hourly, so, but for the most part, where are you feeling right now? Which dog face sort of gives yes, you, um, describes you? I see the numbers coming in. I see some fives. I see some six. I see some nines. Yeah. So, all right. You can still continue to put the numbers in um, as we continue to go through the PowerPoints. So, Wanisha, um, we did a lot of talking, right, since Friday and this um, at noon. And then again, there's been a whole lot of information. And we do this all the time. True, maybe not like this, but we've done it. Um, remember we did the Emotional Healthy Church for the Delaware Valley and was literally every weekend, whether it was a Sabbath Friday evening or if it was a Sabbath day. Um, but this is a lot of information we have crammed into the last two days, right? Do you think we could check in and just kind of see what where folks are and how they're feeling about some of the information? Yeah, you know, I'd love to know. Um, we love the chat box, so get ready for some numbers. We're going to do the ones and the twos. I think we could do the, again, but sort of, um, did you learn anything new over the past sort of two sessions? One, if you learned something new. Two, if, you know, it just reinforced what you already knew. So we, I'd love to hear from everyone where, where, you, where you fall. One, you've learned something new. Two, you've... Uh, sort of reinforce something you've already known about mental health and the state of our community during the COVID um, time that we've gone, we've gone through. So right there in the chat box, ones for if you learn something new, two if, um, you know, it sort of reinforced what you've already known. I think it's been interesting and a very good conversation, I mean, in the last couple of days, and I'm interested to see what people say. Um, from our time together. And maybe some people are just joining us and so they don't have a one or two to give and that's okay as well. Now, I'm old Juanisha, so I'm getting confused a little bit because um, the doggies are one to nine, right? So if, yes. one, if we're putting in ones and twos, I'm not sure if it's the feelings or if it's to your question. Yeah, to my so, question. Yeah, the, the doggies, okay. we, we, I, I see the doggy numbers, one to nine. I appreciate yeah. that. I think people are starting to put in the ones and twos, just the ones and twos right now for right. How, how, if you learn something new or if you sort of reinforce what you've already known. And we got a couple ones and a two, um, which, is, which is great. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you all. All right, so I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen again and maybe I maybe I could have more success this time than I did last time. Um, but when I pull up my share screen, I don't see the PowerPoint. So um, oh, maybe let me see what I can do now. Okay. All right. So here we are. Um, again, one of the things we want to really stress with you all that our desire is to literally start a conversation rather than speak the final word. Um, this is a symposium, if we could use that word, in talking about mental health and mental illness. And so it doesn't stop after today. You guys have a couple of more weeks left in the series. You have some amazing presenters coming. Um, I'm gonna join you guys um, for this because while I do the work, I also am learning as well. So I want to see what my colleagues are going to be presenting. So again, this is literally a starting point, right? If you don't get anything out of what we're saying, 
we want you to know that you are not alone. You are not alone in this pandemic. You're not alone in the, um, the, the, the thoughts, the feelings that you're having. So many of us are sharing in those same things, but it may feel like you're alone because there's not a lot of vulnerability or not a lot of people really sharing how they're feeling, especially in church, because where where's the format or where is the platform to do that? Um, usually when we were in church face to face, there was time in between services. So if you went to Sabbath school before divine worship started, you had that little time to check in with your friends. Um, after church, you had time to check in. Um, I know there were many days where the deacons would be literally shutting the lights off and we're still in the sanctuary trying to have a conversation. Or you're going to potluck downstairs or in the fellowship hall or someone's house. Those things we have lost, right? And so that has, at least for me, been very sad that I can't really connect with my friends at church like I want to, because while we can talk on the phone, we can FaceTime, we can Zoom it up, it's just not the same. You know, I am a hugger. I don't know if you guys remember that from me sharing that when I was with you before, and I miss hugging people, some people, not everybody, you guys get the message, right? And I can't wait to get back to that, but I don't even know when we're going to get back to that because even when we're in the same space, I still want to make sure I'm protecting my friends by not really hugging and being as close as I was because I don't want to get anyone sick, right? And so you're not alone across the U.S. So many people have been talking about how they're feeling. I particularly like this because it really breaks down how 12 months have impacted different ethnicities amongst um, the, the country. And if you look on here, um, there are 17% that it's affected us Black and Brown folks. Now, this is just what, who reported. This is not a representation of everyone. So imagine if everyone reported it, what that would be. And if you look to the left of your screen, the map, 19% of the people who took the survey are suffering or have been diagnosed with anxiety disorder. 19% compared to some of the other diagnoses that on this, this uh, graph. And who can tell us why do you think that anxiety disorder wins the Emmy for today. Who could tell us what? Why do you think anxiety disorder is so high on this map? We're going to take two people. You can unmute yourself and you can talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, I would say because just as the fear of the unknown, you just don't yeah. know what's what's going to happen. Yes, absolutely. That is, I don't know about you, Sister Janie, or if you just sort of gave a blanket statement of that, but I have been struggling with that because I love to be in control. And right now I feel like I am not in control of much. And so yeah. that has caused my anxiety to be high because I can't even tell you what five years from now is going to look like for me. Right. Exactly. So thank you for your comments. One more person. Going once, going twice. Well, I, I think to a sense, um, the isolation that people have had from one another causes anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, we are people, people, but when you mm -hmm. can't be around people, you have not been around people for a long time, isolated from them, then that, that causes anxiety. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And I'm going to just add to what you're saying in terms of isolation is many of us have been um, busier, busy, busy all of our lives, right? We are involved in ministries and church. We're involved in so many different things. And this time has really put a pause on how much we can do. And so what happens when we just sit around? We get into our head. What happens when we get into our head? We start to have all kinds of thoughts. And so... Um, this, this isolation has really not been good for so many of us 
for so many reasons. Now, Wanisha, remember last night we shared some of the good things about the pandemic. So there's been some good and bad. It hasn't just all been bad. And if you think it's all been bad, I want you to kind of take a look over the last two years and just find a little silver lining somewhere because it, it is there, it exists somewhere and to hold on to because I don't know about you, Wanisha, but I believe we're in a temporary state. I don't know that we're going to go back to how it used to be, but I sure know that we're not going to stay here. And it's what almost an opportunity for everyone to sort of take a account of their every day, right? And what the pre-pandemic, what, what it looked like and does it need to be that way mm. now, right? Where are we even working a little more than we should have or not taking as much time with the family? But that's a conversation for a whole different other presentation, a whole mm. different uh, a day. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, but I agree. We should take account of what we, what we need to do now. Yes. And there's been a lot of self inventory and introspective happening. Um, and so there's some good out of that. And then there's some things that we've learned about ourselves that maybe we're hoping at some point to kind of work with, um, changing. So again, the, the survey was done in 2021. Um, and in 2019, I, I just want you to take a look at this graph because this is how much the, the anxiety and depression um, that people have reported. So we're looking at 2019 versus 2021. Those numbers are pretty high, right? And if you were listening this morning and you joined us, you, you heard me say, that I can almost guarantee you that when the next survey is done for this year, that that 41.1% is probably going to triple, right? So what does that mean for us, right? Um, I, I, I'm i gonna do another check-in with you guys because I know that some people said they learned something new and some people said that um, this is just sort of enhancing what they already know. but. The question really right now is how much do you know about mental illness? And I want you to put a one in the chat box if you know a lot about it. And here's what a lot means. You yourself have um, encountered something along the line of symptoms related to mental health, or you have family members who have mental health struggles, or you just know someone that you are very close to that has a diagnosis of mental illness. You're gonna put a one in the chat box for those. Now I want you to put a chat, a, a two in the chat box if you have limited information as to what mental health is. And then you're gonna put a three if you're completely clueless about what mental health is and isn't, okay? So I have it up on the screen, one, twos, and threes. Um, Wanisha, if you could pull open the chat box and kind of share with the folks what you're seeing inside. Yeah, the numbers are still coming in. Um, and right now we're sort of neck and neck. Uh, we have a couple ones, uh, quite a few twos, no threes yet, which um, it's, it's good to hear. And maybe why you know this church should be applauded for even doing this, this um, six weeks um, symposium. And they're still coming in, but quite a few twos. I think twos are coming up. So they have limited information. Um, they're not coming to the table um, totally clueless, as, as number three puts it. But they're not, you know, they don't know a lot. They're, they're not experts in the room, um, which is okay, right? It allows you to really think about how much more you can learn and understand um, and utilize in your own personal life or in others. Right. And the hope that I have for this group that on week number six, everyone's gonna have a number one, right? Because the information that you guys are gonna get for the next six weeks um, is gonna be a lot of information that's gonna start to um, hopefully make sense of where we are as a nation, where we are as a church and where we need to go moving forward. Okay, so we have had this health disaster. I mean, I don't know that there's even an English word really at this point to describe what we have gone through um, in the last two and a half, almost three years now. Um, I remember when I first heard, well, 
let me just say before the pandemic or COVID-19 even was a thing, um, it seemed like everyone in my household had this really bad flu. And I remember it first hit my husband, then it hit our daughter and we were in the ER. And I remember when they tested my daughter, well, the time they did a swab of her nose, but it was a flu swab, right? And they said she has a very bad flu, possibly with some bronchitis attached to it. And so they treated that. And just as we've learned later, um, none of those things really worked. It just sort of had to work its course, right? And then a couple of months later, there was this whole big thing about this thing called COVID-19. And I remember talking to some friends who were like, I had that. Everything they're saying, I had it. And some people had it loud the, the year before. And so we all started to feel very nervous. Um, Juanita, what, what do you remember first hearing and how were you feeling when you first heard? Um, I first heard about it because I was at work and they, we were going home and every day they would say, you know, make sure you take everything you need. And I was like, I don't need to take everything. I can come back to my desk. I don't want to, you know, take my laptop home every day. I don't want to take all the files that I have every day. But it was always a reminder, you know, let's just take, take everything you need. And, you know, you had just come out of the holidays. So everybody was sort of getting back into the swing of things. And it became more and more apparent as you got closer and you heard more and more about it that there might be a day where I don't come into the office. Now, those days are used to be like, yes, I don't have to come to the office. But then I started thinking about, wait a minute, I might not be able to come in the office. Um, and then I started to think about what does that mean for my son who then goes to school and what happens at school? So I really started to get anxious. And I remember talking to my mother, clear as day, that I think I need to go to the Sam's Club, to the big box club, you know, store and just get some things. She was like, no, we've got plenty. I was like, no, something in me tells me that I need to just gather up some things. And I can't tell you like, it was like a week later, what happened, we all experienced it. How much I was like, wow, I'm glad I went to the Sam's Club and I'm glad I brought everything home. But it was just shocking. Let me just put it that way. Put a one in the chat box if the news about the shutdown, the pandemic, the amount of lives that were lost to COVID-19. Put a one in the box if it was shocking to you. Put a two in the box if it was scary. Now, shocking and scary, think it through though, because it's two different things, right? A one if you were shocked or two if you were scared. Now, I don't know, I'm gonna be a little vulnerable and said, I thought Jesus was coming. I thought, I mean, I was like, I'm going on a fast because I gotta get my life right because I'm gonna make it to heaven. And um, so I was scared more than I was shocked because if he was coming, ugh, I wasn't ready, right? And so if anything, the pandemic really helped me to shift my focus on things. And I, and I, as I talked to a lot of people, they felt the same way, like the things that mattered before, after some time, it just didn't matter anymore. What mattered more was that you were so grateful and thankful to be alive because people around us were, was dying. And then people started embracing the families that they lived with or the people that they lived with. I and mean, then, it looks like everyone agrees with you at being scared. Good. Everyone that's, that's, that responded. Okay. Um, are we still scared? Can, can I have one person unmute and tell me, are you still scared or do you feel kind of on this even ground of where you are today? Hi, I want to say that this is Karen. Um, I want to say that the, the, the fear is gone. I think being a nurse, an ICU nurse, you know, having seen the death over and over and over again and seeing people not come out of the hospital um, was unnerving, but I think I understand a little bit more about, about health in that I know that if you start off on a good, with good health or you change your health 
to, to for it to have to have good habits that you can beat it um, with a with a, um, a, a vaccine. Um, some people haven't had vaccines, but with vaccine and good healthy habits, you can survive it with not, without a problem. Got you guys. You are hearing from the health expert that it doesn't have to end the way it does. Am I right, Karen? Are you, is that what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. Because okay. you can change your, some of your health habits to not have sugar, to go to bed on time, to get some exercise, to exercise your lungs and actually, you know, actually improve your health, lose some weight. Um, all those things were risk factors for people who were, who were dying. You know, some of the people were only in the hospital. They didn't have a so-called diagnosis, but they were just overweight. And that was their, that was the, the risk factor for them. Mm, mercy. So let's not think that um, mental illness only came about once the pandemic hit because it didn't, right? The mental health um, disaster in our country was well there before the pandemic but the pandemic only made things worse, right? Um, in a given year in the US today, one in five adults are literally suffering with a mental health problem. There are over 70 million individuals um, of all chronic mental health conditions are in place by 14 years of age. Some of us have been walking around with this disease untreated. Can you imagine what that feels like? I can't even imagine what that feels like. And I treat these people every day, but some of us are walking around with it. Why would someone walking around with a mental health <laughs> issue, situation, disease, why would they walk around with it for so long and not get help? One person, unmute yourself, talk back to us. Why would someone choose to walk around for let's say, years without getting treatment they, they might not have been diagnosed they don't know that they they have that problem they just know something is wrong but they haven't gotten officially diagnosed okay they know something is wrong and they haven't officially gotten diagnosed okay i would say shame as well mm -hmm. um they don't want to be categorized as having something wrong they don't want to be in that place Oh, so are we saying judgment too? Yes. Okay. Well, 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 I was going to say not judgment as much as, oh, maybe that is judgment now that I think about it. Because um, as Black, I know as a Black man, you, you, you know, you're taught if you go to get help, something's wrong with you and you get stigmatized. So I guess that is judgment in the sense that you don't want to be judged by others. Mm. Jeff, you bring up a in, like you bring up a whole nother topic on like what society say gender is supposed to be like and supposed to do. Although that's not what we're here to talk about today, but that is so true that I've had people say to me, when I thought to go get help, I started thinking of all the reasons why I shouldn't. And those reasons kept me from getting help. And the fact of the matter is most of us get help when it's too overwhelming or it's too much, right? Like we try different things, but when those things don't work, we then say, maybe I should seek help. And that's probably why it took years for you to get to that point. Um, there are certain um, mental health diagnoses that by 24, 25, if you haven't really gotten it, then praise the Lord, you may not be diagnosed with that particular thing. But when you think of the 10 year span of 14 to 24, those are the times where at least about 75% of the population are diagnosed. So think about that, the, the, that age span, right? 14 to 24, that is like your prime in your teenage years, leading all the way up to your young adult. So now you're not in high school anymore. Maybe you're working or going to college and things just didn't get better from the time you were younger. Um, trauma has a lot to do also with mental health. And so 
when we look at statistics, when we look at why people are really going through it right now, a lot of it is because it was already there and the pandemic just really brought it way up to the surface and made it far worse. So as we're talking about um, people and, and churches, and you know, we talked last night, we talked this morning that many folks may come to the church because they see the church in a community as a staple, right? They, they, they may never speak to you all on Sabbath as you're walking through the community to get to church. Let me ask a question. Is your church in a community or is it like in a business kind of arena? Anyone? Chef community. Dan, community. We're in the community. You're in a community. Okay, great. So there are houses, I'm assuming, around your church? Yes, several. Yes, we are yes. reaching out. We're gonna have yeah, we have, we, we're in a central location where there are several houses around us, several people in need, and all that kind of good stuff. And I will tell you all, the people in your community, they know how to reach you when they need you. They're going to come to you because they know, you know, in, in the Adventist world, we have a community service department, right? So almost every church within this conference has a community service department. Whether that department is functioning or not, that's a whole nother uh, discussion for a day. But that position is available at every church. So some churches give out, they have a food pantry, they may have like a, a diaper, a diaper place or like baby clothes or any anything that the, the community may need, they may be able to get it at the church. And so when people feel like their backs are against the wall, they're going to come to the church first. Now, what I've learned, I've been an Adventist um, for a very long time, in, uh, for a very long time. But what I've learned and what I've seen is that when people come for certain things, if we don't know how to help them, what do we say? Somebody tell me, what do we say when we don't know how to help someone that comes to our doors? Let me pray, for, pray you. for you. Let me pray for you. Yes, let me pray be, for you, number be one. Warm what else? Be warm and filled. Okay, be warm and filled? Yes. Okay. Pray Third thing, we're gonna pray for you. We might even throw in amazing facts. We might even throw in Bible study. We might even introduce them to our principles or is, or is that not true? Yes. That's a different church. That's a different church. Oh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. Not this church. This church, they're going to pray for you. They might send you to the pastor. Pastor Janie, can you come on for a second? Cause I, I have a question for you. Um, you know, I hate to put you in the hot seat, but I'm going to, I could, I feel like I could do that and it's going to be okay. <laughs> Um, do you get a lot of filtering? Like, do people send people to you that they not know what to do? Yes. And what do you do when you get those people that you yourself don't know what to do? Pray. No. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, I can, if I can refer them to someone who I feel can help them, then that's what I'll do. You know? Okay. Um, do we have all the resources? No, we don't. Um, but if it's something that I can refer them to or somebody or, or a person, then that's what I, uh, I do my best to do. But, but I, I know that my lane is my lane and their lane is their lane. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to be what I'm not. So mm -hmm. I just will, will defer to somebody else. That, that is great. And I, I'm so happy to hear you say that because sometimes, not, not just pastors, Human nature is to still try to help the individual, although we may not know what we're doing, but we still want to be helpful. So we don't mean we don't mean anything bad about it. We just want to make sure right. that the person gets what they need. All right. Thank you. You you the hot seat now. I'm going to challenge your church though to find a community-based mental health program in your area that you can call and say something like this, hey, so we're in the community. Can we set up some kind of a meeting to just talk about how you all can support our community in case someone was walk through the door? Is there a name and a number I can just give? 
And then once you can do that, then your job is done. But we okay. sometimes we get stuck with what can we, the church do, but not necessarily what the community can do because the church is really an extension of the community. Right. And so if we can use the resources within the community, at least for the mental health piece of it, you would be surprised what happens because when you go to a community-based program, they're gonna help you. If you don't have insurance, they're gonna help you apply for insurance. If you need to get food stamps, they're gonna help you apply for it. There's a thing called an intensive case manager or a case manager, which is usually at some of these agencies. And their only job is to make sure the people who come through their door have everything they need. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Because that takes the pressure off of the church to always be the one to find the resources for people. So that's, that's tip number one, is to reach out to the community mental health to find out how you can partner with them. Do you guys have a family life department at your church? Yes. Okay. That can be given to the family life folks to take care of or health ministry can sort of take on that. Um, but I didn't mean, I don't want you, Pastor Jane, to feel like you have to do it, but that is a resource for the church. Well, the, well, well, the funny thing is that we are the family life, my wife and I. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> so, um, but, all right. but, I, but, I, but I'll pass in my health ministry department. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Karen, you hear that? It's coming your way. <laughs> All right. Ready. <laughs> Ready. Um, Armina, can I say something though? Yeah, sure. Yes. Our church at the Blades, um, hats off to the Blades, that we had um, some pamphlets one time and it had this stuff on it. I think the community service department put it out. I have some of the pamphlets here. I took them home and it lists stuff like that. It, um, who you can go to for issues such as this. Mm -hmm. for uh, mental health, even if um, a first aid and um, if uh, emergency situations, where to go in case of an emergency. And it was a whole bunch of pamphlets on the table at the church one Sabbath and I took some. I don't know how many other people picked them up or even noticed them, but someone had placed stuff like that there. Wonderful. And I, I will refer you to... Uh... Dr. David Defoe, yeah. in terms of getting some information about how to access mental health services. Um, you can always go on the AEC website. They actually have a, a, um, a directory on there and it's broken down into the different states. And so you literally can call places in your area. Um, and, and I will tell you a secret. And the secret is most mental health clinicians will partner up with the church because it's a working relationship for both sides, right? And so, um, so that's a, another resource is to use what the conference also has. I know Dr. Defoe was trying to, and this was before the pandemic, to get some folks certified for mental health first aid. And that is a, a I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure of the, the um, agency that provides it, each age, there's agencies in each state that provides this because it's a national um, certification and they teach you the basics of how it's like first aid, but it's for mental health. Um, I believe it is a 16 hour course. It is um, free to churches. So let me just put that out there and they can come in or do a zoom and train key people so that when someone comes to the church, we can give them a number and send them along the way, but we can also spend a few minutes to assess where they're at and what's going on. Because then the third step is we kind of sit with them and make the call together, right? Because most people who you give a number to and send away, they're not going to follow up because what they're going to feel is that they came to a place for help and they were passed along. So we recognize that in the field. So we want to try to teach people how to assess what's going on so that we can make the call together and get the person connected. Does that make sense, guys? Put a one in the chat if it makes sense or two if you, you don't agree. I just want to reinforce as people put numbers in the chat, what you said about when people come looking for assistance to, to just giving a number 
or pointing them into the directions feels like they're just being turned away and their needs aren't being met. I think so often we see that in our work, Armina, that people say, I've tried this, I've tried that church, I've tried this person, and they all just sort of turned me away. And that might not actually be the fact, they just were pointing them in another direction. So mm-hmm. doing the assessments and really sort of interacting and building a relationship with that person or that community or that organization is mm-hmm. always key. Awesome. Thank you, indeed. All right. So no, um, some folks who are having mental health issues, they're not really going to go to a therapist or a psychiatrist first, because there are a lot of us who are afraid of a, a diagnosis. There are a lot of us who don't believe and trust health professionals. And so we come to where we know. So they're going to be coming to the pastors, the elders, the the greeter, the person who is sitting in your lobby that greets your guests coming through, they may be the very first stop. So when you're thinking about a team, and I want you to start thinking about putting together a team of people that can be sort of on your front line, and that anyone in the church knows who those people are, so that when someone walks through the door, if you're not it, stay in the lane that you're given and pass it to the person who would know, right? Because we have one opportunity to save a life and not from a mental health standpoint, but also from a spiritual standpoint as well. How are we doing with the numbers? Are we ones and twos? People are understanding. All ones. ones. Okay. So. And even someone put a link in, which is helpful around the mental health first aid training for Maryland. Can I just tell you guys? Okay. I wasn't going to share this, share it. So we, my family and I, we live in Dover, Delaware. And for jokes, I put in this church's address to see how far you are from my house. Would you know you are the exact same distance as my church in Philadelphia? So I said to my husband, I said, oh, so we have a choice. If if we're going to make the drive, we could also make the drive to Maryland. Okay, I just want to tell y'all that. Don't tell my pastor, though. I ain't going to tell where I'm from, so y'all won't have to tell him. Okay. (laughs) So... Now, this is where we get into the the meats and potatoes. The others was just kind of the preliminary into what we're gonna do. What can the church do? So I'm gonna ask the question of what have you guys been doing? Think about before the pandemic, um, when someone at the church seemed to be struggling with what appeared to be some mental struggles, mental illness, what have you guys done? We did a, a mental, um, we did a healing revival right before the pandemic hit. It was outdoors um, under a tent and um, Ronnie Vanderhorst was the, uh, the um, I guess the facilitator and it lasted for like a week. And um, I thought it was helpful actually, Um, but it was more from a spirit healing from a spiritual side. I don't think we actually had any psychologists or therapists involved, but I know a lot of people got help from that uh, crusade, that it was a healing crusade. Remember that, Pastor Rainey? Yeah, yeah, he, uh, yeah. It, it, it was, it was around. I mean, he, he touched on some of the um, conditions and things that would tend to create certain environments that we might be in, or things that we might be going through. He touched on some of those things, whether whether it was um, um, passed along genetically, or if it's in environments that you were in that may cause certain things. Um, but yeah. Okay, good. So you guys did so, and it was open to the community. That's excellent because yes. believe it or not, that was a seed planted. Those who came out definitely got something from it. And then fast forward here, we are doing this, this now. Tell me what else have you guys done? So someone walks, has, has people walked into your church looking for someone to talk to? Because that's how it usually starts. I just want to talk to, and sometimes I'll say, I just want to talk to the pastor. Has that happened? Yes, it has. 
Yes, that has. Yes, it has. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so when the pastor's preaching, what happens? Do they have to wait till after church? Do they have to come back? What happens? You want the truth or a likely story? The truth. <laughs> you want the truth. Um, well, if we have to go that route, let's, let's go to the next question. <laughs> no, no, seriously. Um, because, and the reason why I'm asking this is I want you all, since you're doing this, to start thinking about creating maybe a manual that says, these are the steps you should take when someone comes to our church who is struggling from a mental health standpoint. And even if you know nothing about the person, even if the person looks disheveled, even the person's looking for food, put them in the category that there's something bigger going on than what you're seeing. And let's look at the manual or let's kind of remember the steps of what we need to do. Does you know, that make it, sense? Yeah, it does. If, if people do come, um, if it's food, you know, my personnel there will take care of the need at that moment in time. You know, if, if, if church is going on, sometimes if it's a need of wanting to talk, you know, um, um, then it's, you know, they're waiting after church to talk to me you know, to talk and to pour their heart out and then um, then, I, then to see what help they can be given, so. Um, can I mention something? Yes. Um, there are people who have come to church on Wednesday when the food pantry opens up mm -hmm. and they come in for food mm -hmm. and they have the look mm -hmm. like, where they presented with the possibility of talking to somebody, they might. Mm -hmm. they, they, they come in and even though they're coming for food, like mm -hmm. you said, they have the appearance that maybe there could be more to it if they were asked. Mm -hmm. So if you are uh, trying to lead us or direct us in the direction of being prepared. Mm -hmm. So you, you do have a church who has a heart mm -hmm. that probably needs to be trained mm -hmm. like you're doing mm -hmm. because people do come through our doors. And so the, the help that you're giving us or, or you're going to be giving us will probably be able to be put to good use. Does, does, does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And I'm giving you to, to use the health ministry's um, word nuggets for today, because the training is more intense than what we're gonna give you guys today, but there are different arenas and different areas to get the training from. But I'm gonna give you what you all need to at least be familiar with. Um, I'm, and the reason I'm doing it, I'm doing this today is because when things open up, the floodgates is going to happen. And, and part of the reason why, and this is like a double-edged sword, most facilities, most mental health programs are full. In my practice right now, um, if I took on anyone else, I would be working seven days a week straight. That's how many calls we're getting, just people wanting to talk to someone. And yeah. so just yep. a this is, you know, this is this is real because one Sabbath years ago, my husband was in his study and he was giving a Bible study. And a lady who knew him that went to the church, she mm -hmm. came up to his office at that time and she wanted to talk. So mm -hmm. he said to her, he said, well, okay, he said, as soon as I finished with, with this individual he was studying, I will talk to you. Next thing you know, someone ran up to his office and said, she's up front at church and she was just venting. She was going through something. She wanted to talk before she went to that point, but he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't available at that time or didn't make himself available. He had no idea and she was up front and they had to, she was just talking. She was just venting us what was going on with her. 
So then he came down and he talked to her and got her down. So at a point like that, you know, what do you do? Was he wrong for not, you know, he didn't know. So what, something was on her mind. I mean, he's seen her several Sabbaths, you know, in the church. She was part of Pathfinders. So what do you do? How do you determine whether you should stop and talk to her or what, you know, what do you suggest a situation as that? Because she did not look like something was on. She just said, Pastor Smith, I really need to talk to you. And he said, okay. He said, listen, he said, I'm almost finished. He said, are you going to be in church? She said, yes. He said, I will come and get you. And then within five minutes, he could see on a monitor that she was standing up front just venting, just just pouring out her heart as um, a situation that had occurred. So how do you know the difference? That is a really, really good question. Um, this is where the team comes into play because I will be the first to say the pastor should not be the first person that people are coming to to talk. There has to be someone that kind of filters what the person mm -hmm. wants to talk about. about and then... I mean, I had a suggestion. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, oh, this is uh, Elder Perry. Um, if I could, I would just like to interject. Um, been my experience when people have come to the church uh, seeking either help or they want to talk to the pastor or leader, usually the person that they actually can't confront at the front, uh, that person will try to seek out an elder. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it has been me that has been that elder and I would sit down with that person to try to navigate mm -hmm. what it is that they need to talk about or what are they seeking and a lot of times what it has been people have been looking for financial aid they're looking for housing they're looking for food or, or, or something of that nature that sometimes we can negate these things even getting to the pastor if you have leaders who are willing to step up and, and say, look, let me step in the gap. Let me see how can I address this issue and move forward. Yes, absolutely. I think that, that is, um, that's a good step to have in place, but I'm not sure that everyone knows that step, right? And so I'll give you guys an example. And this is like not in every church, but it's in my church. And it just so happens that I am the sort of case manager of the church. And we do have a lot of people because <clears throat> where our church is located, it is in the community and it is in an underserved black and brown community. So we have a lot of people who are in need. And so they come to the church asking for us to pay their bills, asking for us to pay their rent, asking for food, asking for you name it, we get asked. So before this because not it's not even a position it's i'm the family life leader as well so it falls in that category um i created a questionnaire and i will share that with you all i can train someone to ask the questions and direct the person in where they need because we found that we were just writing checks left and right because we would say bring a bill and then we would pay the bill and then two, three, maybe six months later, that very person is right back asking for help again. And so while it's easy for some of us to write out a check and pay what the person needs, there's something else happening, right? Mm -hmm. We don't wanna be just a band-aid on a situation. We wanna make sure that we are literally helping people to um, become healthy in many different ways. Um, I read in that just now that there are, there are many barriers to receiving mental health care. And one of them is either insurance, lack of insurance. You could have insurance, but your insurance may not have a mental health rider attached to it, or people just don't have the money to pay. Um, so I'm, I, I'm looking at the clock. You guys are gonna have to bring us back because this information is just a lot of information to give in the short time. but. Can we agree to just jump into the four R's? Can we do that? Yeah. Okay. So it's just four simple things, you know, um, that we think a well-helped mental health equipped church can look like. If you guys are performing these four things, and here's what I, I want somebody, I know this is being recorded, but I want somebody to take a screenshot of this 
so that you guys will always have it to refer back to. So the first thing is to recognize, right? We've talked a little bit about what that is to first, you know, be able to recognize when an individual is struggling with a mental health care problem. Um, don't just overlook it. Don't think, well, the next person that's gonna pass them is gonna help them. Start to recognize what that looks like. Now, for many of us, we need training on that because how do we even know? We don't wanna walk around saying, you need mental health care. You need, because you know, you might get um, the, the pre-saved person, okay? So we don't, we don't want to walk around doing that. We wanna learn how to recognize when someone is struggling. The second thing is when we recognize that they're struggling, are we able to make a professional referral? We've talked about that. I gave you guys a, a, a really great suggestion in how to make a referral and where to make a referral. Someone put in the chat um, how to get trained from the Maryland um, Mental Health First Aid. So you got to know once you recognize this, well, you don't just walk up to the person and say, we're going to refer you. There are some steps in between one and two. And then the third thing is there's a group of people that get trained to really relate to the individuals who are having the mental health problems and or to their families to offer compassion and grace filled ways, right? So the fourth step is to restoration. They have restorative programs in all of our communities that can meet the needs of the people that you're trying to help and the families, because one of the things that I didn't talk about is that mental health does not just affect the individual, it affects the entire family. And most of the time, <clears throat> the family is struggling because they don't know how to help Johnny. And I'm just using Johnny as, so there's training for the four R's, what I would suggest that your church do, because not everyone in church should do this, right? There should be a group of people that this is just their ministry, whether if it's a group of nurses, whether if it's a group of people who are already in the helping field, because those of us who are in the helping field, compassion and grace-filled way of thinking is almost second nature for us. That's why we're in the helping field, because we want to help people. Now, there are people, there are let's just say some introverts who they really, they're okay just being to themselves. That's not the person you wanna put in this committee. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. Um, Armina, before you go, go past, and I know, um, I just wanna encourage you that the four R's aren't for just the people in the outside community. This also recognizes what's happening inside the church. And we often talk about how we can minister to others, but we also have to be mentally healthy ourselves to be able to minister to others. So when you talk about recognizing if people have mental health care problems, it might just be the people inside your church as well that you might actually start with. It's sort of the low hanging fruit of how we can, you know, strengthen the people inside of our congregation before we go outside. Although the, you know, our community will also come in as well. It's one big melting pot, not just either or. That's true. And there, to Wanisha's point, there are some buzzwords that we want to use when talking to our brothers and sisters within the church, um, because we have to see them from Sabbath to Sabbath. And many years ago, there was a survey done that asked if Seventh-day Adventists, this is where the survey was done with congregations, would you go to in your church for help for mental health issues? And more people know than yes. And so the survey even went further to ask why. And the biggest issue was that they felt either the pastor would talk about it from the pulpit or other people in the church would know about it or it was supposed to be secret um, or, or it's supposed to be confidential, I should say. So I don't know where people stand now, but what I do know at this point, we're all going through some things. And so I've had more Adventists come to me now than ever in my career before. And some of them I can't service because I know them. So I have to send them to someone else that can do the work for them. So that was a, that was a good call, Manisha. Thank you for that. Any questions before we move on from the four R's? 
I know you guys have questions about that. Come on, somebody, anybody. No? All right, well, let's keep moving then. And as you as you think oh, about yeah, it, some, of, some people might have time, need time to think about it. Just put it in the chat. We're still here. We're still reading the chat. I'm still monitoring it. So just go ahead and put it in the chat. All right, thank you. Someone said they had a question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. You're going to feel. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, Phil might be having some technical difficulties. Um, Phil, we'll be right here if you want to come back on. Can I say can something? Yeah. Can I say something? Okay. Um, okay, you talk about these four R's, and mm -hmm. um, we, you know, you as you, I don't know, um, Armina, um, it just seems it's a lot. You know what I mean? It's like you have to really feel as though you are prepared for this. You know, because, um, I mean, you know, you, you got to recognize the problem, then refer them to someone. That's easy. It stops there. But then if you stop there, but then when you're talking about the relate and the, the restorative part, um, you know, I guess we have to find out what the programs are ourselves, you know, but I mean, you know, it does, it, it just, it's, it, it takes courage, you know, to be willing to do this. I mean, I'm willing, but you know what I mean? Because, yes. you know, people with mental issues, it puts up a barrier. All you're wondering, okay, are they going to go off on me? And it may not even be to that extent, mm -hmm. you know, and you don't want to give them any wrong information because you don't want them coming back on you because yeah. the information you gave them wasn't helpful. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So one of the things you all could do is, this is a shameless plug and I'm going to use this platform. You can <laughs> contract me and say, hey, Armina, can you talk to John Smith and I can do all these things for you and you don't have to do them. But mm -hmm. Armina is not going to be around forever. I want to teach you guys what I know so that you guys can do it. The other easiest way to do is just partner up with your local mental health community-based program that can do the stuff for you. So all you need to do is say, hey, when we have someone that we're unsure of, can we send them your way? And can you give me a name of one person? So that way, when that person comes to you, you're like, oh, let's call Miss Jones over at Better Way Behavioral Health. And you and this person sit put Miss Jones on the phone, they talk, you say nothing. You're just there to be a support to the person because now it doesn't seem like you're passing the buck because you're literally sitting with them so that they can get everything that they need. And the next important question to say is, do you need me to go with you? Do you need us to help you get there? So if we do those things, Sister Janie, it won't become too much lifting because there's not much on the front end you need to do, but you got to have your stuff in in place. So when they do come, you then know what to do. Does that make sense? Yes, I like that. I really like that. Now, what about though, if there is someone that does not admit they have a problem or they need help and, and it's obvious that they do, mm -hmm. um, but they will not admit that they need help. So they're not gonna go see anybody because they feel they're fine. If you and you know what? Them. You acknowledge and you validate that. You say to them, I get it. It must be really hard to even admit that there's an issue. But whenever you're ready, if you need anything, come back. Because okay. I know we can help you. So you don't have to convince them. You don't have to say, well, I see this and I see that. But you're planting a seed. And the only thing that we in the community ask of the faith-based folks is to plant seeds and send them our way. You don't have to do the work. The problem we're finding is that the faith-based communities are trying to do the work and they don't know how to do the work and they're making the situation a whole lot worse. Okay. And, and just, just to add to that, um, to, um, well, to answer my wife's question, although I'm not you or my niece, but what you have said to us is that this is not something that we readily know how to do ourselves. This way we, be, we become trained to assess and then to be able to refer if need be. You know, because we we are we have not gone and taken courses that or in the field of mental health, so it's hard for us to diagnose things, to look at things, and assess things. 
but when you are taught how to do certain things. And that's why it's for a select, a select committee of people, not everybody. But right. this isn't for everybody at all. It's for those individuals who, who have a heart to help people to mm -hmm. be trained as to how to assess, how to recognize, then how to refer, then how to relate, and then, how, then, 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 then to restore. That's mm -hmm. where the training comes in that. Because yeah. you are professional at this, we are not. When, mm -hmm. we are, when we have the tools to learn how to do certain things, then we are mm -hmm. a little more comfortable doing certain things. Mm -hmm. And that's why training is important for all of us. Yes. For those, for, for those who are interested in it. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, Go ahead, Tony. So, so can, um, can people who have already... Um, like I, I, I have a diagnosis of um, depression and anxiety. I, that's my diagnosis. Can people who have a diagnosis who are getting help be helpful to other people? Can they be a part of the program that we're trying to be like if I wanted to help I mean am I going to be allowed to help I'm I'm one who's who suffers with mental illness so in Philadelphia they first of all sister Tony thank you so much for even sharing that information um I don't take that lightly when people share that because you know we're still we're still learning how to accept that in our society so I really appreciate you for being vulnerable enough to share that information um, in Philadelphia, there's a, a thing called um, resource managers, and they're the people who have gone through very similar things as the callers or the people who are coming through the door. And the model really speaks that if you've been through it, you probably can be the number three, the people who relate to the individuals, because you, you know what it's like to be on both sides. You know what it's like to have been through it and to be maintaining where that person is, right? So that may be, you know, something to consider as a church is what, not who, but what demographics would make up this community, this committee. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's look at um, the stair step approach. We call this a stair step approach because it's literally like climbing stairs. So the first step is everybody can recognize mental health care problems, right? The second step is then they move to the individuals or to more specialized ministries and train individuals within the church. And then the third step is to ultimately help that person access services on some level of therapeutic support for free. Now, that word free, we don't really do that because there's a lot that goes into it. We have to account for dollars and so forth and so forth. But one of the barriers to receiving mental health services has a lot to do with a person's finances. I will tell you, mental health care is extremely expensive. And I know it because in my private practice, we do not take insurance. It is all self-pay. So when people call in, the first thing I wanna know is how much are your services? Well, I wanna tell you what the value is first before I tell you how much you're gonna pay because if I tell you how much you're gonna pay, you're gonna be like, thank you, I'll keep calling around. But if we see the value in what we're paying for, then it makes it just a little bit easier to pay for it. So one of the things that we did with the Delaware Valley is we introduced to them um, this model called EAP, which stands for Employee Assistance Program. And put a one in the chat if you have heard of this model before. Put a two in the chat if you have no clue what I'm talking about. I see that Karen has her hand raised. Yes, Karen. Um, I was gonna, and, and I'll, I'm gonna piggyback off of what you say, and I want you to finish what you're saying first, and and, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll say what I'm saying after you. Oh, that'll give you a chance to drink some water. Okay. Well, I was gonna kind of bring up a little little bit of a variance in that whole thing because there are people who have mental health issues who do not recognize and do not think they have a problem and therefore don't recognize they need to have help. Um, 
people who are possibly, you know, um, isolating, not talking to others, and you, rec you recognize they are not functioning in the normal, you know, for their age, they are not, you know, possibly not working, not having gone to school, isolate themselves. So they don't recognize they have a mental health issue. And so that's a completely different, different set of people than the, those who actually come up to you and say, I've got an issue and I need to have it fixed. Can you help me? Because those people are a completely different group of people than the people who are saying, there's nothing wrong with me, just get away. Yes. Yeah. And you will you will experience that the third category is the parents who come to you and say, something's wrong with my kid. We need help for my kid. And the kid goes, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. It's my parents who are the issues, not me, right? So you're going to have a bunch of different variables when it comes to this. Um, all you can do is get training so that you can present the information. And it may take a whole year of spotlighting mental health here and there throughout the year that finally someone recognizes that maybe I should come check this thing out. Let me just see what they're talking about. Let me call this number and see if they can help me. I don't think they can help me, but I'm gonna call the number anyway. The other very, very, very important thing that you guys have to know as a congregation is Relationship building is everything in this process. Do me a favor, please, if you do not have a relationship with the person that you think needs help, do not be the one to go talk to them, right? Because if you go and talk to them and you don't have the relationship with them, what are the likelihood, you guys tell me, what are the likelihood of them actually receiving what you're about to say. Anybody knows? Use a chat, unmute yourself, talk to me. I'll, I'll unmute. I, I wouldn't say the, it's a zero percent. Um, you know, Jesus was actually all about relationship building. He built the relationship with the, the publicans and the Pharisees and those who came to him, Nicodemus, and had actual relationships with them so that he went to their houses and he you know, ate with them and he hung out with them. And those that's where he was able to kind of make an impact because of his relationship with them and that's what we need to do as well. Yes, so you can easily start to build a relationship with the person. Um, I, I did this test at church one day. So, you know, we're really good for saying, happy Sabbath, how are you, right? So someone walks up to me and I'm like, hey, happy Sabbath, how are you? They say, hey, um, happy Sabbath, how are you doing? And I said, well, so I had a really bad week. Um, my car, and I just went into like all of these problems and they weren't even problems. I just made it up because I wanted to see their reaction. And they were slowly backing away, like as if I was keeping them from doing whatever they needed to do. And I think we get conditioned to asking some questions. And when people want to share, we don't look available to talk, right? And so so much information, so much that we have to kind of think about as we're entering into the space of worship. And like Sister Jamie says, it becomes a lot and it becomes overwhelming. Um, I mean, there's a question in the chat when, you, when you're done. About the substance abuse? Yes. Okay. The answer is yes. There has been an increase in substance abuse, the use of substances, um in this pandemic because people are really rushing to find ways to cope right and they're using some healthy ways to cope and unfortunately they're using some unhealthy ways to cope and so we are seeing an uptick and an increase in the use of substances it, and it can even be sleeping pills something to help you fall asleep you know or something to calm your nerves so it doesn't have to be alcohol or or street drugs there can be other substances that people are also using to learn how to cope i mean i, um, I would like to just make a comment on the relationship thing mm -hmm. um chef danny had mentioned how wednesday nights people come into the church for things and I'm usually there when church was open. And it's so true. They would come in, they would get their food from the back. And then sometimes they would want clothes. Well, prayer meeting has started and they're in the back and they want clothes. And it's obvious that something else is wrong. But I take them through the clothes to pick out what they want. Mm -hmm. And then and I say, you know, is everything okay? You got everything? And they don't know me. So mm -hmm. they're not going to open up to me and say, you know, I'm having issues with this or that. So I agree with that. You know, if they knew me or if we had some type of relationship, maybe they would open up. Right. And you know, the easiest way to sort of bridge that gap is to say, 
Ed, it's so good to see you again, or it's so good to see you. How are you doing since the last time? Because most people who suffer from mental health issues that are coming to your church from your community, they're the ones who are not seen and heard, right? So the fact that you even re recognize them coming back, it's like, oh, maybe I can talk to her, you know? And so there are ways to sort of fast forward, build a relationship with the person by just genuinely showing that you care and that you are happy to see the person. So the model we created with the churches in Philadelphia under this EAP model, which is the employee assistance program, is that some of the churches will pay for three or four sessions for members. And I don't know where they get their funds from. It may come through special offering. It may come through benevolence funds. Maybe it's um, family life ministry designates X amount of dollars. And so I've had people come to the firm from a church in the Delaware Valley. And then all we do is we build a church and then the church pays us. The, the person who comes to see us, we never talk about payment. We just set up the appointments for them. Now we don't go too deep, right? Because the church is only gonna pay for a certain amount of sessions. And then the, the big question is what happens after that? Because we're not gonna resolve the issue then. So what we do with the person is figure out what are their resources? Like, do they have insurance? And if they do have insurance, do they have mental health benefits? If they don't have mental health benefits, um, we have a, a listing of different programs within um, therapy that offers services for way less and sometimes nothing at all. Um, at our firm, we have a grant with um, a university that will pay for people who are looking to get services that are of black and brown communities. And we have to fill out a bunch of paperwork, but we use that for people that we know can't afford to pay it. At our firm, we give out, you know, sometimes three or four sessions per year to individuals who can't afford it. And we're not the only one doing this. A lot of black and brown um, therapists are doing this because we recognize that people need help and there are too many barriers preventing them from getting help. So we are thinking, what is in my control that I can do to provide some level of service to people? Does that make sense to you guys? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And those are the kind of things that we definitely need to, to extend, you know, peer support groups, um, you know, recognizing that they have services within their employment, uh, like using the, EA, the uh, EAP. Um, a lot of people know that they get a whole bunch of benefits. They don't necessarily know that they actually have EAP. And whether they be yes. counselors, uh, mental health counselors themselves, or they are, you know, employees in a, in a, in a firm having access to that information or knowing that the information, just exploring their, their own benefits, they may understand that they get three free sessions or six free sessions per year, you know, as a, as a, a, a benefit of, of their employment, you know. Yes, absolutely. And my shameless plug, as always, is that the young people have slightly different approaches to this because they are also suffering. They are not going through this pandemic as sort of this anomaly. They have, you know, a range of emotions and there are lots of services actually free of charge to um, minors. And it first starts with their schooling um, and they are required to give them some help. And sometimes the community itself and the city, um, and I, I, I probably need to do some research for the area in which you guys um, live in, but they don't have those EAP services because they're not sort of employed, but they have other services that are actually free for those young people um, to receive services. And so if you have a young person, you might want a team that works with um, adults, and then you might want a subset that just sort of identifies with the young people, because it's a different uh, route to go in. Yes. Um, I see Phil has his hand up. Do you still have your hand up, Phil? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I have a, a question, a, little, a comment and a question. Um, you know, a couple Months back, a coworker did reach out to me, you know, since I'm affiliated with a church, asking these exact same questions. You know, and I did reach out to my pastor and I reach out to a lot of people, but my question is this. Um, a lot of times, you you know, you mentioned numbers and resources that we have on these papers, but I just did a test. I actually called those numbers, emailed, and I'm not, I didn't get a response back. So what would your advice be, you know, for somebody that 
encounters that because that could be very frustrating. Imagine if I had sent that number and those emails to that person that was in need and they call and they didn't get an answer back. That would have probably caused, uh, you know, I don't know what, what the effect on them would have been. But I wanted to test just to see how that process worked because, you know, pandemic was an eye opener as far as mental illness. It's just so pervasive everywhere that, you know, this is a problem that as a church, I feel we have to confront because I'm looking at your four R's and the last two steps, that's what the church needs to be doing. The last two steps of that four R process, that's biblical. We need to be involved in this because we have a problem with evangelizing and lowering membership. So if we do this the right way, we could touch lives and I, we could increase membership in our church in a very beneficial way that's going to be beneficial on both sides uh, of, of, the, of the divide. So I have a question for you. Um, I'm not sure what numbers you called. However, um, when we were talking about the um, mental health aid or mental health first aid, that wouldn't be a number you would give. But you remember this morning I gave a number and it was in the chat. Any, well, anyone remember that number? I, I call like, there's actually a church in this area that does like a program. Somebody passed the number to me somebody that runs the program. So I'd send that person a message. But I also, I, I think I might have reached out to Allegheny East uh, previously about some information on that. And I never got a response. So, you know, that those are the, 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 the main places I actually reached out to just to try to get more information. So there is a national mental health hotline. Hotlines are 24 seven. You're going to get more um, you're going to get someone live, right? If you call a hotline versus if you call a church or a business. Um, and when someone is in need, we, we probably want to send them to the hotline. And the cool thing about hotlines is that they're trained to get them connected with someone in their state. So the person who answers may not be the person, you know, um, in that particular state that you live in, but they can connect you with someone who's in that state. And I, I've done the same thing you did because I refer to, so I've called and tested some of these places and they actually will stay on the line with you. Yeah, and just to, just to add, the one of the things, the, the first thing that the person told me is they don't have any money, they don't have insurance. So that was kind of terrifying to me because I already knew that you know, a lot of insurances do not cover uh, mental illness treatment. So I was like, I might have to go to like a nonprofit, specifically a church. To, and some of the stuff you actually talked about, you know, that information is what I needed back then, because all the stuff you're talking about now, I'm like, man, this is what I needed. So this is very, I, I really appreciate this because it does help people to understand that, you know, as a church, maybe we need to have some of these programs where we can supplement or get people stipends to go out to get that treatment because that money insurance issue, that is a real serious barrier. I mean, I've seen it firsthand. So I appreciate you, Brother Phil, for saying that. Um, Karen, I can work closely with you to kind of help develop some of these things so that we were sure that the numbers and information we're giving that people are actually there to help, right? Right. So. I got excited while I was presenting and I saw one of my friends pop in. He is actually one of the presenters in this thing, Dr. Terry Parks. Are you still there? Oh, well, maybe I he am. left us. <laughs> okay. Hi, buddy. Hi. Hi. Hey, 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 hey. How are you guys doing? We are so good. Thank you so much for jumping in and supporting. Um, I do see you did put something in the chat about the EAP. Can you? Can I just ask you to speak a little bit about that? Well, what I put in the chat was that you know when you were speaking about EAPs, a lot of people don't know. I think somebody's you know I think Karen said it that a lot of people that know they work they work for years at their agency and don't realize you know there is a resource there for you. And, you know, it, it is the EAP, Employee, uh, Employee Assistance Program. And, and I was saying that a lot of people feel that um, if they uh, run out, like, okay, you're gonna get um, five sessions, eight sessions. United Healthcare usually gives eight, you know? <laughs> so I usually see United Healthcare people, A, you know, Sigma, uh, Optum, all of those different people, and they give different numbers. 
But what I'm saying is, is they think that that's it. And so when that's it, it's like, okay, you know, you can go back and get more. And they don't know that. You can go mm -hmm. back, you can get more sessions, or your therapist can even write a note to get you more sessions. Because how can you help someone who's been suffering for years in three sessions? That's kind of impossible. And it's almost, you know, kind of like impossible to even like give that number. I think if you came out with a number like of a minimum, like maybe eight, okay, you know, some brief psychotherapy, eight sessions, you may do some work in that. And then you say, okay, I'm going to ask for more. But for the most part, people will just say, okay, I got my eight sessions and then they don't want to pay. So they don't think that you can get more. And so I always tell them, I said, go back to your uh, employer and let them know that you want more sessions. In general, they'll get them. Sometimes you have to write up something different. Um, mm -hmm. Like if you're using, uh, I, I can't remember the one I'm, one of the ones I'm with. Uh, I think um, Inspire, I can't remember who it is, but if you, if you go back to see them and they ask for more, they will say, well, that's long-term therapy. Now you gotta go ahead and pay out of pocket which I think is kind of wrong, but, you know, if they're getting the sessions, you know, they should give them more if someone is truly suffering. So mm -hmm. that's all I was saying. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I actually worked at Health Advocate, which is an EAP, and I literally was the one authorizing the sessions. And you're so right. We're told they only get one and they're done. But what happens is when you go to therapy, other things come up. So maybe I referred you to Dr. Parks for anxiety, but once you met with Dr. Parks, you realize that it really isn't anxiety, it's depression, that's a whole nother issue. So you get another eight sessions for that. And um, and it right now the EAPs are giving sessions away because they understand we're in a pandemic, right? So take advantage of whatever they can give you because it is free. They will pay for it. It is a part of your benefit packet. Um, the way that the EAP, we used to look at it is that if you're getting therapy, it keeps you out of the hospital. And if it keeps you out of the hospital, it's low cost for the employer. It's low cost. So like not to give way too much information, but just go back and ask for more. They can either say yes or no. And if they say no, go back to the therapist and let the therapist write a letter that says, hey, Johnny could really benefit from more because the therapist has a relationship with your employer. That's why they're on their panel. But ladies and gentlemen, I feel like we are way over our time. And I apologize, but this just tells me you got to bring us back. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 you know, that is not a difficult thing for me to do, you know, to, to bring you guys back um, in because this has been very, very beneficial. Um, you no, know, we've learned a lot. Um, we've gained a lot of um, um, information to where we can now just chew on and, 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 and move beyond this point right here. Um, we will be in contact because I do, I do believe and I do want um, some training for a group of individuals you know, as to how to assess and how to handle these things. And, and, and you know, they're, they're the frontliners. They're the ones who would do all the, all the needs to be done, you know, and then that way we can also learn how to, how to do the four hours in, in the right way, you know, and be helpful to individuals and to ourselves as well, you know. So, but um, thank you ladies for all that you all have done. You shared a wealth of knowledge um, to all of us, um, and if anybody didn't learn anything, something wrong with their learning abilities. Um, but I sure, I sure learned a whole bunch from you guys, and I, I thoroughly appreciate the, how you got win it, how you win it. I like, I love your format. Number one, your tag team format, as to how you all did it, you know, which is different, unique, you know. But that's that's as you are, I mean, unique, you're different. Um, so I appreciate that very, very much. You know, that's a good, that's a good uniqueness. Um, so I appreciate that very, very much. Looking forward to um, the next five weeks. Uh, of that, that we have left with our health conference as well. I mean, you two have gave us a, like I said, um, a, a, a fantastic start. The flood, I mean, the, 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 the gate was open. Y'all came out running full steam ahead. You know, the finish line is gonna be in May. So there's still much track to be run, to be ran during this time. So thank you guys very much. And you guys will come back um, to, to, to assist us and help us in our training process um, that we wanna get on immediately. You know, not just say we're gonna train you, but then wait till December, January, but no, immediately, 
So we can begin to practice when our church doors open up, we have to be ready. Yes. You know, when they open back up. Yes, absolutely. I agree. I agree. I just want to make some comments as well as we uh, get ready to kind of um, to close. And that is, um, again, the wealth of information that we have received has been phenomenal. Uh, we're going to definitely have a, um, a um, uh, candor link on our website that will be able to give people some direct information, um, a link with your resources, a link that will, you know, kind of speak to week one um, and, and um, you know, how to get to, you know, some of the 24 hour, uh, you know, hotlines that will help people on the immediate. And then we'll also be able to have the training and with that training will actually be a benefit. So I'm looking forward to actually making that transition and actually be a benefit to our community. And that we'll see, um, you know, come to fruition before, you know, before time, uh, you know, expires. So I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, I'm excited. Um, I thank you, Armina and Manisha. Um, um, your, your knowledge is superb and the information was excellent. I believe that everybody doesn't even have to put a one or two in the, in the chat. I believe everybody got something from this. I know I did. And I'm in health, in, in health, mental health. I've done mental health before um, for a couple of years. And it is a wonderful, wonderful. I want to thank all the participants, all of those who have um, been here with us, who've asked questions, who are in it with the you know answers and, and being involved and, and uh, being connected to this this presentation it is was absolutely wonderful. We have five weeks to go, y'all. I can't even wait. I can't even imagine what we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna be able to learn from this. So um, I'm excited. Thank you, Dr. Parks, for getting on, um, and we're looking forward to seeing you in a few weeks. And um, I am uh, looking forward to to um, making our future better than our past. Um, Amen. I want to take the time now to um, have prayer. And close this out, um, and um, and thank everybody again for for being here. Um, let's pray, Heavenly Father. I want to thank you, Lord, for just this knowledge, Lord. You've given us all different talents, and we thank you, Lord, for the talent and the passion that um, Armina and Markeisha have for this subject. It is not for everybody, and it it takes a lot of dedication to get down to the meat. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help us. To, um, to see some where our, our talents may be, even though we may be an architect or we may be um, a secretary, we may have an, a, another passion. We ask you, Lord, to bring that to pass, Lord, that we might be as, of assistance to those around us. Thank you, Father, for all you've done. Thank you for all those who participated and will participate in weeks to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right. You know, you know I, want, I want to get with you too, God, because I, I don't want to tap some more into the youth aspect of it. Um, when it comes to mental health and all those that we did, we talked a lot, you know, but I think we need some, some, some direct targeting of, of our young people as well, you know, because they're, they're a whole different category of ball game, you know, than everybody else is. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having us. We told, we enjoyed ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I want to share right. my screen real quick because I want to show everybody what is coming up in the few weeks to come. Um, you can see Armina and was here for week one, week two. Next week is um, uh, Gary Graham, and he will be with us next week, the, uh, Friday the 8th and the 9th. So look forward to, to seeing him then. And for our uh, midday service hour, we're going to have um, Pastor George Jackson. So we look forward to, um, to seeing you next week. We're going to be talking about um, help me, sadness, depression, anxiety, very specific, very focused. And we want to make sure that everybody is here to receive all the wonderful information. This is um, 7.30 on Friday night, Eastern Standard Time, and Saturday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Be on time because you want you want to miss anything. And that's it. Thank you. Amen, amen, amen. All right, Blaze, town hall meeting at 7.35, website, Sab School Lake. See you all then. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care now. Bye-bye.